So what I want to talk about today, ladies and gentlemen, are pearls of Christian wisdom taken from our scriptures. And I want to show to you how the Christian faith is a way of building your entire life, as a way of building an entire ontology, humanity in the image of Christ. And I want to give you pearls from our scriptures as an example of what Christianity looks like lived. So the first one that I want to talk about, and I'm going to split them up into themes. The first one that I want to talk about is 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The essential message of the Christian faith, brothers and sisters, is that we cannot save ourselves. We can't be good enough to stand in the presence of God. The heart of Christian spirituality is it's not like the religions of men, where men try to construct their way to God. The essential narrative of the Christian faith is that God searches for man, that God finds the resolution to the problems being faced by man. We fall short of the glory of God. You know that yourselves. Just reflect upon your own life and think about how many times you do things that you know are wrong even wrong according to your own conscience, even wrong according to your own thinking, quite apart from any religious teaching, you will recognize the fault within yourselves. This the Bible calls sin, that we have fallen short. Sin is literally what the Latin means, of the glory of God. And so that he, for our sake, made him to be sin. Who is it talking about here? It's talking about the Messiah, the one prophesied hundreds of years in the Old Testament who would be the suffering servant in Isaiah. He who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And it says that in Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. The Bible is saying that our sin has a consequence. That it separates us from God. And it is saying that we do not have the solution to this reality. And this is where Christian spirituality begins. It's where the Christian way of life begins, in this acknowledgement that we fall short of the glory of God and that God himself is the one who resolves this problem. And how do we participate in this resolution? In 1 John Verses 1 to 9 we read, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, if you examine your life only for a moment, you will recognize that you sin and that you fall short of what God expects from you. Insulting the honor of God is the ultimate offense. God has given to us a free gift of salvation. It isn't something that we have earned. It isn't something that we can win for ourselves. It is something only that we can receive and we can receive it by confessing our sins to God 
and trusting in what God has achieved through him he made to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me use an analogy. It is as if every human being is in debt, a debt that they cannot pay off because the debt is an insurmountable debt. And God has given freely a check to everyone in their back pocket to pay the debt off completely. The difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is that the Christian has cashed the check, but the non-Christian holds on to the check and never benefits from the gift. This is where Christianity begins. This is where our spirituality begins. And this naturally leads to a spirituality of humility. It leads to one of the virtues that we Christians live by, which is this idea that we should rejoice with joy and be humble before what God has given to us. And it is from this wellspring of humility and joy that the Christian life emerges. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The point of the Christian faith is that the gift of salvation outweighs whatever difficulties, whatever harms, whatever sufferings befall us in this world. The gift of salvation is such that we can rejoice in all circumstances. And rejoicing, why? Because we have been given a free gift, a gift that we have not had to work for, a gift that we have not had to earn, a gift that we did not deserve, but a gift that was given to us anyway. And so we pray without ceasing. And how do Christians pray without ceasing? The church is a single body a single unit and there are always Christians praying. Traditionally, Christians pray the hours. That is an office of hours that originate from the church, from the temple in Jerusalem. And so we pray at 12 o'clock at night, 3 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock in the afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 6 o'clock in the evening, 9 o'clock at night. You get the picture. And every hour of the day, there are always Christians praying. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 6, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, if as Christians we believe that the default position before God is one of humility, is one of rejoicing before the free gift of God, we Christians believe that we live according to the Word of God. We live according to the values of God. We live according to the doctrines of God. We don't live by the opinions of men. We don't live by the doctrines of men, the ideologies of men, the laws of men. We as Christians live according to the Word of God. Because it is those spiritual truths 
it is those spiritual truths that feed the human soul. It is those spiritual truths that build up the soul in truth. And without those spiritual truths, there is no food for the soul. Man doesn't live by bread and water. He lives and grows by truth. When he lives his life according to lies, his life becomes broken. His life becomes distorted. His life collapses like we saw in the USSR, like we saw in Nazi Germany. I'm talking. Please wait. Show patience. I'm watch Please wait. Show patience. I'm talking. Then you'll just have to do it next week. So, in terms of the manna from heaven, we Christians know as a fact that if you ignore your spiritual self, your life will become dysfunctional. If you ignore the psychology of your mind, your life will become disordered. As Christians, we recognize this fact. We recognize that men have to live according to truth. And when they don't live according to truth, their lives falter and break down. And God showed this through humbling us, through allowing the fruits of our false doctrines to destroy and to harm our lives. It says in Psalm 73, 25 to 26, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God of the God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those of us that build the human heart, that build the human soul upon the word of truth, find within that nourishment to face the challenges of life, to face persecutions, to face resistance, to face the challenges that beset us in life on all sides. When we draw down from truth into our heart and our soul, we grow in strength, we grow in truth. This is the heart of Christian spirituality. And the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, is because the Christian spirituality values the next life more than it values this life. What we build and the treasures we store up for ourselves in heaven outweigh what we do in this life. Christ said in Mark chapter, ch chapter 6, 35 to 36, and because of the fold in the paper, it may be Mark 8, 35 to 36, but someone will correct it in the comments. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel's sake will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his own soul? How many people stir up for themselves treasures in this world, consume themselves with the occupations of this world, satiate their lusts of this world, and then find that all of these things betray them in the end, that they have built themselves and their lives upon the quickening sand of temporality, of those things that are only temporal and passing, only to be betrayed by the meaningless of the transient and the corruptible. Christ teaches us that we should build 
ourselves in heaven, that we should build our treasures in heaven, that we should occupy ourselves with the things of the next world, not the things of this world. These are the priorities of the Christian, to build this life in light of the next life, in light of the coming judgment of Christ. In Romans 9, 8, 31 to 32, we read, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all, how will he not also with graciously, with graciously give us all things? As Christians, we take our confidence in God that all the things that we need to get through this life, God will give us. And you don't need money. You don't need experiences. You don't need a good career. You don't need a wife or a husband. You don't need so much that we think is necessary. What we need is the cultivation of the fruits of the Spirit, the virtues of the Christian life. When we cultivate the armor of God, the character of God in our lives, then we can face the trials and the tribulations of this life and the transiencies of this life. It says in Scripture, <clears throat> in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We as Christians believe that you live your life according to the vocation of God, the calling of God. And we place our hope in this truth of God in the next life. But that does not mean that we are men and women who lack action. We are commanded in Scripture to prepare our minds for action. To do this, we teach our minds the truth through the practice of discipline and the cultivation of virtue. By these disciplines and by this cultivation of virtue, we prepare our minds so that at any given moment, we Christians can be men and women of action, not people who just sit on their hands and pray, but people who organize themselves and prepare themselves to take action when it is necessary to do so. And we are undaunted, undaunted because we have set our hope in Christ to face any challenge. And we are called to be sober-minded. This doesn't just mean don't be intoxicated. This also means being realistic in our thinking. We Christians are called to be realistic in our thinking, to be sober-minded to not give ourselves over to fantasies and to fictions, but to believe that God will equip us with the grace to meet the challenges that we face. In Ezekiel 36, 26, we read, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And what do these metaphors mean? These metaphors mean that do not be stubbornly minded. Don't be stubborn about the, the truths 
of the Christian faith. Don't be resistant to the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are called to live your lives as saints, to live holy lives. And if you abandon that calling, your heart is like stone. To reject this free gift that God has given you is to an affront the honor of God. He has given you an invitation. He has given you a free gift. And if you reject it, then you reject the honor of God. You insult the honor of God. And should not God be just? Should he not punish according to the crime? And if the value of the crime is eternal, should not also the punishment be eternal? If the crime is infinite in value, is not the punishment also infinite in value? It says in Hebrews 4, 15 to 16, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every way, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Christian spirituality is linked to praxis. It's linked to action. It's linked to doing. We draw down in prayer the spiritual resources that would feed us to then take actions and move forward in our lives to deal with the challenges that we face and that the church faces. This is the heart of Christian spirituality. Are there any questions? So, do you want to help? Yeah. You need your Bible. Next talk.